The study of dinosaurs has entered a new age. Predators have now become patients. High-tech medicine is extracting new clues from ancient bones and revealing the genetic secrets of dinosaur DNA. Fossil hunters and physicians have joined forces to become the dino doctors, reconstructing the hidden world of the dinosaur. In this laboratory at the California State Polytechnic Institute, scientists are reaching back millions of years into the fossil record. Here, molecular paleontologist Raul Cano is trying to pry loose the genetic code of dinosaurs. He is one of the world's preeminent experts on ancient DNA. In the fall of 1992, Cano and his research partner, George Poinar, extracted and cloned DNA from a 40 million year old bee preserved in amber. Advances like this inspired the blockbuster hit Jurassic Park. In the film, scientists create dinosaurs from ancient genetic material, or DNA. Incredibly, microbiologists may have already achieved one of the key breakthroughs depicted in the film. If their claims are true, Kano's team has already accomplished the first stage of the Jurassic Park scenario. From the bone of a Tyrannosaurus rex, they believe they have extracted minute quantities of dinosaur DNA. The first step has been taken and we've shown that we can get DNA. And we can get macromolecules out of these things and in the future generations of scientists might be able to improve upon these techniques. Cloning a dinosaur is still the stuff of fantasy. Yet other medical advances, such as CAT scans, are giving us tantalizing glimpses of dinosaurs' social habits and their sex lives. But before high-tech analysis begins, fossils must be first unearthed the old-fashioned way, in a place like Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta, Canada. Here, in one of the world's richest beds of dinosaur bones, paleontologist Darren Tankey excavates fossils for the Royal Tyrrell Museum. Tankey is a pioneer in the field of paleopathology, a blend of medicine and fossil hunting that's revealing new clues about dinosaurs from their ailments and injuries. Yes, yeah, it's definitely pathological. You can tell just from the bone surface texture here. Life for the dinosaurs had its share of tough breaks. Scattered definitely everywhere on the surface that. are the broken bones of duck-billed plant eaters. Today, he has unearthed a hadrosaur bone. You can tell by the surface texture this bone has undergone a massive bone infection, which can be confirmed by just looking at the bone in cross-section. You can see the normal bone here, and then all the new secondary bone growth in response to the infection has occurred up in here. Not only does this bone provide evidence of an interesting infection, it sort of provides circumstantial or indirect evidence of behavior. A severe leg infection like this one would have made walking difficult and exposed the animal to attack. But this infection is of such a long-standing time, we can tell that from the thickness of the new bone on the surface, that this implies this animal lived quite a long time. Because the injury had time to heal, Tanky believes this creature was protected, probably as a member of a large herd of duck-billed dinosaurs. For the duck-bills, Tanky believes getting bumped and bruised was the price of life in the herd. Duckbill dinosaurs show a, a vast array of injuries, mostly restricted to the tail 
We find injuries from the tip of the tail, which suggests animals accidentally stepped on them. Middle of the tail, where the vertebrae have been broken in half and then refused back together. The base of the tail, we found uh, fractures there. We've got rib cages that show extensive fracturing as well. This leads me to believe that duckbill dinosaurs almost certainly were highly accident prone. Tanky handles each dinosaur bone with great care, gently wrapping a plaster cast around it for protection. Then he sends it off for a battery of tests performed by Dr. Bruce Rothschild, a rheumatologist in Youngstown, Ohio. Rothschild specializes in treating arthritis, but in his spare time, he diagnoses dinosaurs. Together, Rothschild and Tanky represent a new breed of paleontologists, part doctor, part dinosaur hunter. This collaboration of sciences gives us a new perspective on the lives of the dinosaurs. Rothschild is especially interested in sauropods, the family that includes the familiar Brontosaurus and Diplodocus. According to one theory on arthritis in humans, when people gain weight, they add stress to their knees and hip joints. But when he studied the x-rays and CAT scans of sauropods, the heaviest creatures of all, he found no signs of arthritis. The fact that it was uncommon in sauropod dinosaurs weighing 60 or 80 tons tells us it can't be purely a matter of weight. There has to be another factor. The hinge joint nature of the, jo of the weight-bearing joints of dinosaurs did not allow for osteoarthritis, but the more variable joints of humans, the knee joint of a human, for example, rotating rather than just simply bending, allows for instability, and it's that instability that appears to be the cause of the osteoarthritis, or the major factor in its development. And this is something that dinosaurs were apparently protected from. The mighty sauropods fossils are found on almost every continent. The huge plant eaters flourished from about 200 million years ago until their extinction 65 million years ago. The largest sauropods measured nearly 100 feet long. Their necks spanned up to 35 feet and they weighed around 70 tons, the equivalent of at least 10 elephants. They may have eaten as much as six tons of vegetation a day. When Rothschild examined x-rays of sauropod vertebrae, he noticed that in about half of the samples, a few vertebrae were fused together, always near the base of the tail. Humans have a similar adaptation to protect the backbone from stress. Doctors call this fusion of the backbone DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. Rothschild ran the fused dinosaur tailbone through a CAT scanner to see if it resembled dish in humans. And it turned out that indeed this fusion that occurs is identical to what we see in humans as dish. Now dish in humans is a protective phenomenon and the question is why was it occurring in dinosaurs? Since these fused tail bones were seen in only half the sauropods he studied, Rothschild reasoned it was a sexual trait something found either in the males or the females of the species. He came to the conclusion that it was a female sauropod adaptation. Their tails were especially strengthened to keep them raised during mating. But sauropods also had a problem at the opposite end of their huge bodies. How did Diplodocus manage to support its immense neck without falling over? The problem was even worse in Mementosaurus, found in China. At 35 feet long, its neck was more than half the length of its body. Again, medical technology revealed the answer. CAT scans of several neck vertebrae of a Diplodocus showed that they were not solid, but riddled with air pockets. This is really quite impressive. You can see the individual struts of trabecular patterns within the bone and supporting structures of the bone. But you notice how much wide open space there is. The lightweight neck design explains how these enormous dinosaurs were able to remain standing. 
Some paleontologists suppose that sauropods graze in the treetops with their heads raised like giraffes, perhaps even rearing up to reach the topmost foliage. But University of Pennsylvania paleontologist Peter Dotson proposed another model. He suggests that sauropods use their necks rather like a vacuum cleaner hose, standing in one place and reaching round to suck up food. Consider the possibility that sauropods may have been browsing on ferns on the ground and that their long neck was just to reach around in a wide swath without doing a lot of moving around. Dodson doubts that the sauropod skeleton would have let it raise its head very high. That they don't have the bone structure in the neck. They don't have tall spines over the shoulders that would give them the leverage to lift their heads up. Did they simply rear up on their hind legs? Dotson doesn't think so. Their circulatory system could not have handled the enormous blood pressure required to pump blood to the head. The higher an animal reaches, the higher the, the, the vertical separation between the brain and the heart, the greater the blood pressure that's required. And uh, with the longer the neck, the more staggering the blood pressure is required. And did sauropods suffer blackout when they lifted their heads, or did they generate such huge blood pressures that they are in danger of blowing out every capillary in the body? Other paleontologists have suggested that since sauropods had very small brains, they probably didn't require much blood anyway. If so, they could have easily raised their heads high without bursting a blood vessel. Perhaps the greatest anatomical mystery is whether dinosaurs were warm-blooded like mammals or cold-blooded like reptiles. Mammals' bodies maintain a constant temperature, allowing them to be active throughout the day. Reptiles are active only in the daytime when their body temperatures rise by exposure to the sun. A hot-blooded dinosaur would be much more active and aggressive than a cold-blooded one. Indeed, it would behave like an entirely different creature. Now, a new method of analyzing dinosaur bones has led to a startling conclusion. Dr. Anusia Chinsami of the University of Pennsylvania is slicing fossil bones into wafer-thin sections and examining them under the microscope. Well, the interesting thing is that the growth of, um, of dinosaurs suggests that they have a reptilian characteristics of a cyclical pattern of growth, but some of them are able to grow fast without any interruptions. And this kind of pattern seems to indicate that dinosaurs don't just fit into, um, into just the reptilian category of cold-bloodedness or the mammalian category of warm-bloodedness. Many paleontologists suspect that metabolism varied greatly from creature to creature. A predator, like Velociraptor, built for speed and agility, may well have been near the warm-blooded end of the spectrum. But for a giant sauropod, warm-bloodedness would have been a disaster because its body would have overheated. In general, the larger the animal, the less uh, desirable warm-bloodedness becomes. Uh, one thermal physiologist uh, came up with the opinion that a warm-blooded sauropod, that is to say a 30-ton animal, uh, in full sunlight at midday would have suffered meltdown. So for very large animals, uh, uh, high metabolic rates is probably more of a problem than it is a solution. Experts in wildlife physiology have transformed the thinking about dinosaur metabolism. The new techniques are shedding light on dinosaur disease, behavior, and the workings of the brain. But could biomedical technology really pull off the ultimate feat? Extracting ancient genes to make a living dinosaur? The Jurassic Park scenario? The new science of molecular paleontology has already taken the first steps. At least two teams of scientists claim to have discovered fragments of dinosaur DNA, the genetic instructions 
for making a dinosaur. In 1992, paleontologist Mary Schweitzer of the Montana State University's Museum of the Rockies was examining a slice of 65 million year old T-Rex bone under a microscope. She noticed something no one had ever seen before. The blood vessels of the bone appeared to have been preserved along with what looked like red blood cells. If T-Rex blood had lasted all that time, it meant that DNA might also be present. She sent the specimen to Raul Cano's lab at the California Polytechnic State University. Kano's team had already extracted ancient DNA from the blood of a 120 million year old weevil preserved in amber. And they claimed to have also extracted DNA from the T-Rex bone Schweitzer sent. But is it really T-Rex DNA or the DNA of some contaminating factor? I could never say I've isolated T-Rex DNA. That's not something we could ever prove. The only way that anyone could make the claim that they've isolated dinosaur DNA is to grow a dinosaur. And that is not possible with ancient DNA. Another team of molecular paleontologists led by Scott Woodward of Brigham Young University recovered DNA from some 80 million year old bones found in a Utah coal mine. Because the bone fragments are so small, the animal cannot be identified. When we first saw that dark spot on the gel, it was both very exciting and also kind of scary because uh, this isn't supposed to happen. You know, this is 80 million years old. There's not supposed to be any DNA. If these are indeed dinosaur bone fragments, then the findings may truly be dino DNA. These four rows represent dinosaur sequence, and these four rows represent an Asian elephant sequence across the same portion of the gene. If you look real close, you'll notice that they're not very similar, that they're, the patterns are not similar in these two areas, which mean that the dinosaur and the Asian elephant were not very closely related. Remarkably, the recovered DNA bears little or no resemblance to that of any modern animals. But experts are skeptical. The bones may belong to some other ancient creature. In theory, researchers could take a strand of dino DNA, plant it in a cell, and then incubate it in an egg. The DNA would replicate itself, creating a copy of the creature the DNA came from. But the idea of hatching a dinosaur is likely to remain science fiction until we know much more about genetics. The real goal is not to resurrect a dinosaur, but to compare the tiny fragments of DNA already found with genetic information from other creatures, including living birds and reptiles. It will allow us to get more information not only about organisms that have already become extinct, but give us information about organisms that are presently living with us. Uh, we can learn about evolution, uh, the rates of mutation, we can learn about how genes change over time. Um, the, uh, the, we might even get some ideas of the condition of the environment in which these organisms lived and died. If enough DNA could be found, scientists could build up a family tree of dinosaur species. But the samples of DNA would be so small and the molecular instructions so complex the paleontologist Peter Dodson is skeptical that will ever happen. We might in, uh, uh, make uh, an analogy with a set uh, with, with an abridged, uh, an unabridged dictionary, a dictionary that fat. I mean, the instructions for building an organism represent that much information. When we find dinosaur DNA, we're just going to find a few fragments. It's like ripping one page out of that unabridged dictionary and then ripping a strip of paper off that page, and that's the amount of information we're going to have. It's going to, uh, pessimistically, I think it's going to tell us nothing. It's going to be like a parlor trick. Well, um, I disagree that any methodology or any strategy that would promote learning is a sideshow. In fact, science is, in the very essence of science, is to learn and to find things that we did not find before. It doesn't really specify what is 
useful and what is not. Knowledge in itself is useful and valid. And anything that you can get from a dinosaur or from a bacterium or from a piece of rock that we did not know before is worth doing and knowing. If recreating an entire dinosaur from its DNA remains an impossible dream, someday the genetic research may fill crucial gaps in our understanding of dinosaur evolution. So when we find dinosaur bones, not only might we find dinosaur DNA, but also the microorganisms that probably killed them if they die of an infectious disease. So that gives us some clues about the evolution of infectious diseases and maybe how to treat or how to control modern infectious diseases that affect humans. Until dinosaur genetics is better understood, paleontologists will continue to dig up new ways to extract the fossil's ancient secrets. Together with pathologists, the dino doctors will keep applying the latest medical advances to the oldest patients on Earth.